Well, folks, it's time to kick it old school. Uh, so you can feel cool. <laughs> hey guys, this is Andrew with HKN, and today we're going to do a couple of simple examples with uh, stability in both the S and Z plane. So uh, the first thing I want to talk about is the notion of poles and zeros. So poles are where you, the denominator of your transfer function goes to zero, and zeros are where your transfer function's numerator goes to zero. Um, and so if we plot these on a complex real plane, so if you don't know what a complex real plane is, basically all it means is that if we have a complex number, and we write complex numbers as a plus j, j being the square root of negative 1, uh, times b, where a and b are integers, or uh, not integers, real numbers, uh, then we get this entire thing here is a complex number. And so we can't write a complex number on our traditional number line. So what we do is we take all of the real numbers and keep them on our normal number line, but then we write the imaginary components on an orthogonal line. And that's actually really helpful because the because uh, when we do anything with j, basically what this does is it rotates it 90 degrees. Just like a negative is like rotating 180 degrees on the real axis, using a j is like rotating 90 degrees or negative 90 degrees on the real axis. So it's a useful tool. So if you need to know more, I would look up and then come back. But we're going to go on assuming that you understand this concept. So if we take our zeros, and when we plot our zeros, we use a circle just to show it's a zero. Um, it really doesn't matter what the, where these guys end up. They kind of characterize the response. Uh, if you actually have a zero in the uh, right half plane, you get some undershoot in the response. Uh, but as far as zeros, they do not have anything to do with stability for us. So I'm just going to plot that one zero and move on. So we also have poles. And so poles we give x's. And so we're going to have a pole at negative 3 and a pole at negative 2 on the real axis. And then we have a pole at positive 4. So we have two poles in the left half plane and one pole in the right half plane. So how can we tell if this is stable or not? Well, the simple answer is if any of the poles have a real part, so if it's A part is positive, then it's unstable. And the reason for that being is that we know that the response, or if we take the inverse Laplace transform of this transfer function here, so we get our natural response of our system, is going to look like e to the st, because these one because we know that the Laplace transform of e to the st is just 1 over s plus, uh, I guess it would be e to the at, sorry, e to the at would be 1 over s plus a, or 1 over s minus a, one of the two. Um, I think it actually might be minus a. But, oh yeah it is, okay. Minus a. So uh, we know that if we take this back and this becomes a positive number, then our response is going to shoot off to infinity. So we need this to be a negative number so that it doesn't shoot off to infinity for any kind of just constant input. So if we get a positive number, we get e to the 4t, which is going to shoot off to infinity. And so the imaginary number here, if we remember e to the imaginary number, is actually just a combination of sine and cosine. So it's bounded between 1 and negative 1 in both the real and the, imaginary, and the imaginary part. So there's no reason to look at the omega axis when we're talking about stability. As long as the real part is negative, we can have stability. So plotting these guys here, this transfer function is unstable. Due to a pole at s equals 4. So, or you can just say due to a pole in the right half plane, which we abbreviate RHP. So, that right half of the plane. 
So that's how it works in the S plane. As long as you can plot your poles and zeros, you can tell this. Uh, there are a bunch of other ways to tell stability if you can't, but we can uh, we go over those in other videos, such as Ralph Hurwitz and uh, Nyquist criterion and stuff like that. So very quickly, I'm going to talk about how to go how to take our notions from the S plane and go over to the Z plane, which we use for discrete time transfer functions. So uh, the transformation for Z, if we want to transform from S to Z, is we use E to the S capital T where capital T is actually your sampling time. So the positions of your poles will actually be affected by how quickly you sample, which is important to remember because if we sample at different speeds, we actually will get different responses. So, uh, but the, anyway, if we have E to the S, S being a complex, <coughs> excuse me, S being a complex number, sigma plus J omega, um, all we get is another complex number uh, which I'm writing a plus j b over here. So basically what I'm saying is that e to the j omega plus sigma is equal to a plus j b. So e to the imaginary uh, complex number just gets you another complex number. So if we're talking about how to go from here to here under this transformation, what we can say first is that if we evaluate along the j omega axis. So if we do that, we'll have z equals e to the j omega t. And so this is purely imaginary. So we have this, if this guy we just call theta, sorry about that terrible notation there. Uh, if we just call this guy theta, we have e to the j theta which we know, because e to the j theta equals cosine plus j sine, that this becomes the unit circle. And we also know that if we have z equals e to the j zero, so if we have the origin, then this is going to evaluate to one. So the origin gets pulled out to positive one, and then the j omega axis actually just gets put to the unit circle. And because the j omega axis is the definer of stability here, that tells us that the definer for stability in the z plane is actually just the unit circle. So if your poles are inside the unit circle, then your system will be stable. And if your poles are outside the unit circle, then they will be unstable. So. Uh, one last thing is if we look at the real numbers, e to the real number is still going to just be a real number. Um, but what we know is that if we have e to a positive number, so e to a positive a t, then this goes over a very large range of numbers. So we say that that is on the outside of the unit circle. It goes on a very, very large um, array of numbers, then we can also have the negative version of that uh, to get the negative numbers. But we also have, uh, but th to get the negative numbers, you need to have an e to the j pi on the end of it. So this is equal to negative 1. So you actually need an imaginary component to get a negative number in the z plane. Um, but uh, the very large range of numbers that this follows actually goes greater than 1 out to infinity because this is bounded below by 1 for, t, for uh, anything greater than 0, t greater than 0. Um, and if we have e to the negative number, or e to the negative at, this is always going to be less than or equal to 1 for t greater than 0. So that is inside the unit circle. So negative real numbers, or anything with a negative real number, is going to be inside here again. And this is our stability region then. Anything with a positive real number over here goes outside and out to infinity. So effectively, what we've done in going from the S plane to the Z plane is we've taken the origin and placed it at positive 1. We've taken the J omega axis and curled it around into the unit circle. And everything in the left half plane has been placed inside that unit circle. And everything in the right half plane has been stretched all around outside the unit circle. 
So if that doesn't make very much sense to you, all you need to know is that when you're working in discrete time and you're using uh, the Z, that all of your poles have to be inside the unit circle, otherwise you get instability. So we have a transfer function here that we can look at. So we have Z plus 1 for a, pole, for a 0. So that equals Z equals minus 1. So that's right there. Um, sorry, that's a 0. So we want to use our 0 no notation. Uh, and then we have our poles here at z equals uh, 1 over 2 root 2 plus j, plus or minus j, 1 over 2 root 2. And so this is actually just uh, a 45 degree angle because our real and imaginary parts are the same. And we know that this uh, 1 over root 2 would be uh, on the unit circle. So if it's half of it, so it should be about half the distance there. So we have uh, a positive one here. So we're going out to 1 over root 2 and then up 45 degrees. So it's going to be something like there. And then we know that poles, this is a rule for uh, both the z and the s plane, poles come in complex conjugate pairs. So that means that all poles are symmetric about the real axis. So if I have one up here, I have to have one down here. And so you can look at these guys here, where uh, if you don't like this, you can write this as 1 half angle plus minus 45 degrees with the positive real axis. So. All, both of our poles are inside of the unit circle here. So that tells us that this transfer function is stable. And that if we created a system that had this transfer function uh, for regular uh, inputs, it will not go unstable. So I hope you guys learned something, and I hope that you understand the difference between the S-plane and the Z-plane, and how they're related, and how stability works there. Um, there are other tools to determine stability, but uh, looking at if you have the poles and zeros, it's the easiest way to look at it is just for the z-plane, are they inside the unit circle? And for the s-plane, are they all in the left half plane? So I hope you guys learned something, and uh, have a good day, guys.